Cooper Show with Grim. Welcome to the Grim Leftover Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. All right, folks, it is time for another Grim Leftovers episode. This is number 23, by the way. It is Monday, May 20th, 2019. And we are here on reallibertymedia.com, rlmradio.xyz, freedomsnetwork.com, realliberty.org, internet radio, tunein.com, oh, and a bunch of other places. Yeah, you can't catch us live on Spreaker anymore. We can't catch this show live on Spreaker anymore because I have that set to private until after I'm done with all the editing and such. Otherwise, it goes straight on over to iHeart. And I don't want it to go to iHeart until I'm done to it, done with it. So, uh, but that's all right. You got all, all kinds of other places to listen, so you can't listen on Spreaker. Eh, big deal. Nobody was listening there anyway. <laughs> but it's, it serves its purpose for what I use it for. Anyway, I uh, hope you're all having a good day out there, or had a good day uh, at this point in time. Probably most of you are thinking, well, day's over with. Yeah, stays stays light to 8 o'clock here now, so... Uh, I got three hours left of light, which means some period of time after the show, I still got light. Although, today, it's not real pleasant outside unless you like to be uh, fighting the wind. Fighting the wind. And uh, that's uh, that, that's what's going on out there today. And it's cool, too. It's 54 degrees right now. Mr. Rob Works says he hates my intro, so uh, give me a better one. Make one for me. I'll use it. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you got to say welcome to all the folks over here in chat. You know, we're, we're global, by the way. We're not just here on the interweb on the local chat room. We're global. We're inter-freaking national. All around the world, people tune in. From New Zealand to Dallas, Texas to Argentina to the U.S. of A. Uh, yeah, yeah, I left Texas out of the U.S. of A. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, anyway, so hi and howdy to all the folks here in uh, the chat today. That's right. Uh, we, we got the uh, barman, my, my favorite, my, my my first bot creation. We got Beetle and Cowboy Tech and myself and the Mighty Moose Girl. We got DC and Anti and Asmo, Charles Sedoni, Free and Slaved. We got Graham Z, the wonderful Graham Z. Yes, indeed. We got Mr. I, B, Don, C. Java Doctor, the Ponder Gander, Miss Kate, and Rob Works, uh, Romes, and Vanna White Bot. She's she's a terrific bot. We got Mr. Vin E, uh, and the Weather Dork Bot, which is a limited, limited, limited function bot there. We got the Woodman and Miss Beth Z. We got the Phantom and, 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 and well then. <laughs> we got the Cyborg Doodle in Dakota and Frumpy and... Gooberzilla. We got Gromit and JJ's 999. JJ's a kiss, a sock, a puppet, a smart ass bot, and a fake Vanna White at the bottom there. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's all right, man, Rob. If you, if you don't like the uh, intro there, then uh, feel free. I'll, I'll, I'll accept any entries you may have for a possible better intro. Uh, I've been using that guy's music. Uh, what the hell is his name? Uh, I, I used to use another one of his songs for my my old show, the RLM News Show. Um, McLeod. McLeod? Is that his name? Something like that. I can look it up for you if you're really interested. But he puts out a bunch of free music uh, that you can use as, and uh, for stuff. And so I do. I do! <laughs> All right, I got a bunch of stories lined up for you today. You know, I was going to, on this particular show, I was thinking this last night that, all right, well, today or, or tomorrow's show, I am not going to read any stories. I'm just going to get on there and ramble about stuff that that really uh, chaps my hide or whatever you want to say. Grinds my gears, as, as uh, Peter Griffin says on his show. Um <laughs> But the thing is, and, and, and you know, 
I could do that. I could come on here and just ramble on randomly about things that just seem wrong. But you all know all that stuff already. At least those of you here. Now, those of the other people out there in the world that may listen to this show via YouTube or BitChute or Spreaker or uh, any of the other hundreds of places that it goes to, uh, they may not have that information. But then again, do they want it? And Which is really not of my concern whether or not they want it if I give it. It's just... Uh, and, 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 and I'll pl- probably think of uh, maybe an additional show at some point. Uh, to do that kind of thing. But since this show is the Leftovers show, uh, I think it'll it'll just remain as a Leftovers show rather than being a free-form rambling on about stuff that I, the way I think stuff should be. <laughs> Which, of course, I'm right because, well, I'm me. You know, you may not think I'm right, but I, being me, believe I'm right. Anyway, Russell and my Jimmies, you got it, Mr. Puppet. <laughs> Let's get on to these stories. Um, <laughs> chat type thing. So I appreciate that. So, oh, so, oh, so much. Don't you know? <laughs> All right. This first story is coming from ctvnews.com uh, over here in, uh, I think it's Canadian, Canadian website. It's a Canadian story. But, uh, it, it, and it, it's about a Canadian thing. Of course, it's no different here in the good old U.S. of A. This was posted on April 15th of this year. Weed prices soar since legalization. Illegal pot still selling for half price, though. <laughs> Because they're freaking idiots, that's why. Um, Cannabis prices in Canada have soared since legalization with prices on the black market. Hey, isn't that racist? Oh, uh, prices on the black market now reportedly less than half of licensed dispensaries. The average cost of a dried gram has skyrocketed since legalization last October. According to users who voluntarily entered uh, what they paid into a St- Statistics Canada app, StatCan. StatCan. <laughs> the difference between legal and illegal prices is even more dramatic, with a gram in a regulated store averaging $9.99 per gram, compared to less than $6, well, these are Canadian dollars, I guess, six forty per gram, on the black market, some 36% cheaper. When the government tries to restrict and limit access, they increase the prices of the available legal supply. But uh, consumers always go where there's a deal. They're not going to pay your extortion. According to a Vancouver-based cannabis advocate and semi-love of my life, Jody Emery. (laughs) All right, she's not the love of my life, but I do admire the girl. Um, she, she's, she's a very active activist, and I, and I appreciate much of what she has to say, although uh, and I disagree with some of her stuff, too. Canada's priciest pot on the North, is in the Northwest Territories, where it cost $14.15 per gram. Legal weed prices have leapt uh, by almost a third in New Brunswick, where it's $8.27 a gram. In Manitoba, price per gram jumped 28% to $9.14. The cheapest province is Quebec at $6.75 per gram. To be honest, uh, but you know, you could go and walk in on into Quebec there and try and buy some at one of their places. But unless you speak French, you're probably not going to be able to understand them. They won't be able to understand you. I guess you could do the point thing. Point. Hey, what's that? Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I'll probably uh, I'll probably just continue purchasing from my friends and from illegal dispensaries. A cannabis customer outside the Honey Pot, Toronto's first legal store, 
told CTV earlier this month. Their prices are ridiculous. They're $16 a gram. The average cost in Ontario now sits at $8.05 per gram, one cent above the national average. In Alberta, cannabis is selling at an average of $9.07 a gram, according to StatCan data collected up to March 31st. Average usage in now or and low legal purchase levels suggest British Columbians may be sticking with their pre-legalization methods of accessing cannabis. And it's not just because of the price gap. According to StatCan, BC has seen the smallest post-legalization price increase of any province, with the cost raising of, of a gram raising by merely 3.7% uh, to $7.15. Some legal cannabis customers have complained of high prices, poor quality, and poor selection, seeing some return to their dealer on the street, or in his house, yeah. Uh, 75% of total cannabis that's being consumed, 70%, not 75, of total cannabis that's being consumed was purchased illegally. 30% was purchased from legal sources. But uh, mainly, or many uh, Canadians still prefer to go to regulated shops where they can be inspected, detected, neglected, rejected, uh, where growers and retailers take a cut of the profits, and the government gets tax revenue. A report from ArcView Market Research forecasts total spending on legal cannabis in Canada grow from, to grow from $569 million in 2018 to $5.2 billion in 2024. There's going to be a lot of stone people up there, let me just tell you. <laughs> Marijuana in Nova Scotia is retailing at an average of $8.73 per gram, a 19.7% increase from pre-legalization levels. Prince Edward Island saw the smallest price increase of any province other than BC, with a 5% jump, uh, leaving the cost of cannabis at $7.69 per gram. The average cost of a gram in Saskatchewan has risen by 10.3%, since October, and now clocks in at eight dollars and two cents. Uh, by the way, the article was corrected uh, to state the difference between legal and illegal cannabis is that illegal cannabis is thirty six percent cheaper, not as it says in the headline half price, but still thirty six percent is thirty six percent, and uh, depending on uh, how much of this stuff you buy, I'm gonna say. Go ahead. Uh, if I can, Sock Puppet says, if I can sing most of the lyrics to La Ba La Vu La Vu, Couture Avec Moi, <laughs> obviously I can't because I can't even say that. <laughs> uh, I, I, th I think I recognize the, uh, the song, but I, uh, yeah, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> This next article, I I, I was gonna, I, I was I, I was just gonna bypass it because it's, well, it's propaganda. It's on zero hedge, and yet it's still propaganda. So, uh, yeah. Here we go. Sleeper cells. Sleeper cells. Now I sleep a lot. Does that make me part of a sleeper cell? I sleep. All right. Sleeper cells. <laughs> 10,000 illegal aliens from, quote, terrorist nations roam free in the U.S. of A. Approximately 10,000 illegal immigrants from countries designated, eh, designated by whom? Designated as state sponsors of terrorism. Uh what, what, a, what a terrible phraseology, are living within the borders of the United States, according to the Immigration Reform Law Institute, the IRLI, uh, first reported by Breitbart. IRLI revealed last week that it had obtained documents under the Freedom of Information Act 
that revealed that 10,000 illegals have not yet been deported despite having been ordered to leave the country. Yeah, well, shows how well your orders are going, huh? IRLI said the said Iran led the pack with over 6,000 or 61% of their citizens with removal orders, followed by Syria with 20%, Sudan 18%, North Korea with less than 1%. So somebody somehow decided at some point to designate Iran and Syria and Sudan as terrorist nations, terrorist states. But what has Iran or Syria or Sudan ever done to qualify them as a terrorist state? They provide no information on that. There's no evidence of that happening. However, they have been designated by some unknown people as terrorist states. Congress has recently held hearings where the United States intelligence officials, which uh, U.S. intelligence, yes, there's an oxymoron for you. Um, intelligence officials, another oxymoron, have suggested that Iranian sleeper cells in the U.S. are awaiting orders to strike. Awaiting orders from whom, may I ask? <laughs> The IRLI executive director, Dale Wilcox, chatted with Sirius XM's Patriots Breitbart News tonight. Patriots Breitbart News. Oh, oh, you're making my headache. <laughs> uh, news tonight last week uh, warned, warned that the 10,000 illegals from terrorist countries are very dangerous. Ooh, boogie man. We have 10,000 aliens. And no, they're not from Mars or other planets out, <laughs> out in the wilderness, out in the spatial wilderness. No, 10,000 aliens. Some of them are criminals. And that's why they have been ordered removed. You could have some that might have come to the country legally at some point. However, they've committed crimes by, and they've been ordered removed. Then, of course, you have your garden variety of illegal aliens. <laughs> hmm, I wonder if they're uh, vegetables or fruits. Uh, garden variety of illegal, illegal aliens who have jumped the border or overstayed a le legitimate visa. Legitimate visa. <laughs> and uh, they've been told to go home, and yet they continue to hide in this country which only stresses the danger of sanctuary jurisdictions. California has the largest population of Iranians outside of Iran. You know, I think this guy that uh, ran the 7-Eleven down by where I used to live was Iranian. He was a nice guy. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was all right. He was no terrorist as far as I could tell. Anyway, California is a sanctuary state. Uh, California is not cooperating with immigration authorities, and can you blame them? So, so their sanctuary law is preventing ICE from removing these individuals. Of that number, 10,000, 6,000 of these individuals are Iranian. Ooh, those evil Iranians. We're going to false flag, I mean, uh, uh, figure out how they're doing something bad. Yeah. Despite the dozens of sanctuary cities protecting illegal aliens from deportation, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE holes, uh, were able to deport about 44, 44 illegal aliens in the last two fiscal years who were known or suspected terrorists. Known or suspected I suspect they were all suspected, none of them known. But if you say known or suspected, then you are then you are going to assume that some of them were known. And if they're suspected, you're going to think they have a reason for that suspicion. But yeah, no. 
Anyway, there you go. Full on propaganda right there on zerohedge.com. Uh, feeding in from Breitbart, another huge uh, neocon propaganda site. <laughs> Absolutely crazy that, uh, that this is the way these this is being talked about on a site like Zero Hedge, um, because they used to be against this kind of nonsense, and and now it seems they're all in on it. So. Eh, what do you say? What do you do? All right. Now, we've talked about this topic. We, I say we, I mean me, Mary, Grammy Mary, uh, Moose Girl, Flash, uh, Hal Anthony, uh, Vin. I don't know if Vinny's talked about this or not. I think Vinny's kind of left this one off to the side because he's he's got other issues that he's dealing with. Hey, hang on, I get a sip of water here. All right, I think Vinny's left this issue to the side, but I think most of the really, really Liberty Media people, the RLM radio folk, have spoken about this uh, this problem that is here and coming at a super fast rate. But I like this headline, and, and so I thought I'd share it with you. <laughs> it's on it's on the Mind Unleashed via the Waking Times, uh, posted April thirteenth. Prominent biochemistry professor warns 5G is the stupidest idea in the history of the world. Not unlike South Park's biggest douche in the universe, this is the stupidest idea in the history of the world. Now, if you think about it, when you think about all the things that you know about what's happened in the history of the world, for something to be the stupidest idea, not even uh, things that have actually been done, but things that people have thought of, ideas, in the history of the world, it's pretty damn stupid. If this guy's correct, and I think he is. <laughs> And, and I know I know a lot of people that would agree with me on this. Here, anyway, here it is. Many scientists, doctors, and professionals, whatever that means, are issuing dire warnings about 5G. See, professionals, that could be anybody. If you um, do something and you get paid for it, you're a professional. So everybody probably has been paid for something, so everybody's a professional, right? Not the point. <laughs> just, just going off on words there. But uh, yeah, uh, the international rollout of the fifth generation wireless technology, 5G, is well underway despite increasingly vocal opposition from scientists and medical professionals who are desperately trying to warn us, you and I, and the rest of the world, of the well-documented dangers of 5G. The government and industries involved in the 5G rollout, rollout have zero, eh, let's take it down a little bit from zero, way below zero, concern for public safety because the technology promises to be exceptionally profitable while also forcing everyone everywhere into the emerging technocracy. Adding to the voices of dissent is Martin L. Paul, Ph.D., a professor emeritus of biochemistry in basic medical sciences at Washington State University. In a study and presentation, he takes a closer look at the 5G technology and issues a major warning for us all. Putting in tens of millions of 5G antennae without a single biological test of safety has got to be about the stupidest idea anyone has had in the history of the world. The report offered four explanations as to why 5G is significantly more dangerous than earlier generations of wireless, wire, wireless technology, uh, noting... 5G is predicted to be particularly dangerous 
for each of four different reasons. The extraordinarily high number of antennae that are planned and required for, in order to implement it. The very high energy outputs which will be used to ensure penetration. And you know what they do when they penetrate you, don't you? <laughs> Bend over, we're going to penetrate you. Uh, the extraordinarily high pulsation levels. Supa, supa, supa. The apparent high-level interaction of the 5G frequency on charged groups, presumably including the voltage sensor charged groups. He begins by speaking about the current safety guidelines for 2G, 3G, 4G technologies, rightly pointing out that the government-approved guidelines ignore any adverse reactions that occur at dosages or exposure levels below said guidelines. In other words, as Paul points out, they are meaningless when it comes to safety. <laughs> he goes on to discuss eight ways in which this technology adversely affects human health, citing extensive scientific documentation. Lowered fertility. Well, that's part of the uh, Agenda 21 right there. Neurological and neuropsychiatric effects. Also a, an Agenda 21 item. Cellular DNA damage. Well, that's just a bonus, right? Uh, aptosis, the programmed cell death. Oxidation stress and free radical damage. Endocrine hormonal effects. Excessive intercellular calcium. And cancer. Sock Puppet says, If I am looking for the forest of common sense on 5G... It's the one with the fewest trees. Right on, sir, right on. Paul, uh, Paul's conclusion does not mince word when describing 5G, saying the 5G G rollout is absolutely insane. There's a video here with his presentation about all this that you can uh, watch uh, after I post the blog up after the show, which won't take long because I've already got it all written up. Um, <laughs> but there's the link for that. And there is more to that story as well. Um, but uh, just beware. There, this is going forward. It, it ain't nothing going to stop it. It don't matter if people start dying in the streets, dropping dead. Yeah, and you're going to know, some of you all out there will know, people will know, people will expose the fact that they are dying from 5G. But that will not be the official story from uh, the professionals. <laughs> all right all right all right what i have for you next is something i should never have to tell anybody anymore at this point in time i shouldn't have to explain it i shouldn't have to tell you where to go find it but i have seen things here in the chat and on the interwebs over the past several months many years that tell me that not everybody quite understands how to do this. And it's simple as hell, at least for now. This may not always be the case. They may find a way, eh, they, they know of ways, to eliminate this. Because they don't like it that you do this. But you should, until that point in time, do this. From uh, S Suite Office blog, uh, yeah, S Suite Office. By the way, if if you uh, want to try an open office type product that's not Open Office or Libre Office, S Suite Office. Check them out. They got really good products. I, I've I've installed several on my computer, and um, they are very very similar to uh, what you might think of as as Microsoft Office, but they're not. It's all free. It's all open source. And you can go there to S Suite Office and, and download their stuff. It's great. Anyway, they posted up this blog, oh, last June. Say no to personal data tracking. Surf the internet without ads. It's frightening to know that your personal data can be tracked everywhere you go on the web or everywhere you walk on the street since most of you all are carrying those freaking trackers with you. Uh, they call them smartphones in most places. 
Yeah, they, you carry them with, uh, with you, and they tell them everywhere you go, how long you stayed there, probably who you're meeting with. They record your audio. They record your video. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so how to block web advertisements and data tracking with just a few clicks. As we all know, advertising from Google, Facebook, and other large marketing companies, and make no mistake, Google and Facebook are large marketing companies. You may think of it as a place you go and chat with friends you haven't seen for years, or post photos of what you had for breakfast or uh, what your dog is doing today, but no, they are marketing companies and, and you may think you're a customer, but you're not. You're a product <laughs> that they sell. Anyway, so these companies are just messing up website pages and eating up all of our precious data bandwidth, not, all, not to mention the tracking the hell out of our private browsing history. It's time to stop these assholes from doing what they're doing. Now it's possible to block all, and it's been possible for years, by the way, it says now, but it's been possible to block all that crap and the annoying ads with just one application add-on or plugin. And it's free. What's it called? Everybody? Adblock Plus. <laughs> That's right, Adblock Plus blocks banners, pop-ups, tracking malware, and more. By default, non-intrusive ads aren't blocked in order to support websites. And you can easily whitelist any website that you want to. Some websites require that you whitelist them, uh, but uh, that's up to you whether or not you want to visit a site uh, once it says that, yeah, we, we need you to do this. Um, anyway, Adblock Plus is great. Uh, and, and, and you could just put it on any browser that you got. It really, any browser will accept this. Um, it's a little different on, on your Androids and such, but it's still available and, and you can still do it there. Uh, so you just pick which browser you want and you go to adblockplus.org and, and uh, download it there and it'll, it'll install on any or all of your browsers and, uh, and, and, and you're good to go. So like I said, I, 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 I don't, I shouldn't have to say this. I shouldn't have to talk about this. And maybe I don't have to, but from what I read here in the chat and on the web, um, I do have to talk about it because some people, a few folk, just aren't getting it <laughs> they just aren't getting it all right um next another thing that i've talked about here for years and suggested to many people and i know many people have adopted uh but it's so simple to do it's not quite as simple as adblock plus but it's really very simple to do which is change your dns server from and I would I normally ignore stuff on PCMag.com, but um, for this one I I made an exception because it's correct. So here's how and why to change your DNS server. The domain name system is essential an essential part of your internet communications. Upgrading or just changing, you call it upgrade or, or whatever you want, to a better DNS server can make your surfing both faster and more secure. So if you're still using the DNS server that comes from your ISP, you're making a mistake. You probably have a basic picture of how surfing the web works. You type pcmag.com in the address bar, your browser requests that page from a web host, and PCMag sends you a plentitude of useful information. Yeah, they may be um, a little biased on that, but it's not quite that simple. There's another player involved and understanding the fact that fact can help you protect your security and privacy and even speed up your surfing. Here's the thing. The servers that route your internet requests don't understand domain names like pcmag.com. They only understand the numeric IP address like 52201108115 or the longer numeric addresses that come in the modern IPv6 system. 
So uh, what do what do is what does the DNS server do? Some machines only speak numbers, but the people want to use memorable domain names like reallibertymedia.com, rlmradio.xyz. Domain names uh, like zappa.com. Okay. To resolve this impasse, the domain name system, or DNS, handles, translates, it's, it's a database. It's got all of the IP addresses of all of the servers that match up to, to which name's in there. And you ask for a for a name, they they say, okay, well, that's this IP address. They send the information over to the, that, that name, and that name comes back to you in the form of whatever's on that website. Your home browser or your home network typically relies on a DNS server supplied uh, by your ISP, like Comcast or whatever other evil ISPs you may have. After your browser sends the server a domain name, the server goes through a moderately complex interaction with other servers to return the corresponding IP address through thoroughly vetted and verified if it's a much used domain name, the DNS server may have that information cached for speedier access. Now that interaction interaction is down to numbers and machines can handle getting the pages you want. Anyway, I don't need to go through all that crap. Uh, what I want to get to is down here at the bottom. What's the best DNS server? Alexa uses my porn, really? <laughs> Have at it, Alexa. All right. Um, <laughs> DNS attacks and problems occur when DNS is not a priority for your ISP. Getting away from these problems can be as simple as switching to a service that makes DNS security and privacy a priority. Now, and this is one of the problems um, that I, I find out there. But it's going to come with, with places like PC Magazine that have some connection with Google. But it's out there and, and it should be better than your ISP regardless of the fact that it's Google. But uh, the first one they list, Google Public DNS has been available for 10 years with the easy to remember addresses, IP addresses. 8.8.8.8 and 8.8.4.4. Google promises, and they would never lie, a secure DNS connection, hardened against attacks as well as speed benefits. However, the one that I use and recommend to people, founded in 2005, OpenDNS has been offering secure DNS even longer. It does not have memorable IP addresses like Google's, but it does offer a variety of services in addition to DNS servers focusing on privacy and security. It offers what it calls Family Shield servers, which filter out inappropriate content. If you decide you want to use that, you don't need to use those. But if you do want to filter out inappropriate content, such as uh, Washington Post or things along those lines, Huffington Post, those kind of things that I would like to filter out. Uh, yeah, it'll do that for you. The company also offers a premium parental control system that gives you more granular control over filtering, and there's a little price there involved in that, but uh, um, I, I do highly recommend OpenDNS. It takes like a minute to change your DNS server from whatever it is that your ISP set to what you want it to be, and you can do that machine by machine, or via your router. So it's something that, for you to consider. And they also mentioned Cloudflare here, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but uh, I would probably trust Cloudflare over Google. And then they explained here how to change your DNS server, uh, how to change your laptop's DNS server. It's the same as on your desktop. Um, how to change your router's DNS server. So it goes through all that information there for you, should you so desire to do so, and hopefully I, I, that you will, because um, it, it's a good thing to uh, do. What time we got here? 49, okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> although I, 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 I generally ignore this next guy, 
he's dead on with this article. So let me get a sip of water here. Although in his style, uh, he does add a little ooga booga, ooga booga. <laughs> this posted on henrymaycow.com on April 20th. Uh, Israel, the state of, has a backdoor on every single Microsoft device. With Microsoft's move to Israel, Israel now has full and total access to all home, business, corporate, and soon military computers. The P Pentagon Cloud Contract Jedi a sick, psychotic, racial, and religiously supremacist state with an ultra-right-wing extremist at the helm has the planet at its fingertips. Microsoft Windows 10 is now fully, fully coded in Israel. The Windows Security Center updates R&D. It's all done in Israel. The NSA has to mess about to get their malware implanted in 90% of the world's computers. Not Israel, they just include it with a forced update. It's official. Windows is now fully malware in its own right. Yeah, it kinda always was, but it's much worse now. Uh, yes, and it does get worse. The Intel hardware backdoor is not limited to the management engine. There are dozens of God mode registry entries that give access to DEC, Deeply Embedded Core. The Goldman Sachs funded ARC processor. This means a simple entry such as 0F3F, one character, uh, in machine code at the standard command line level will give full access to a system with full administrator privileges. Cybersecurity specialists are full-time searching for these computational entries and are that are potentially millions. All of these dozens of software and hardware backdoors were implanted from around 2006. Uh, there were some before that and many more since then. It, it's accelerating. And, and on when Intel moved to Israel. The ramifications are catastrophic in nature. Israel is now deeply in bed with China and Russia on the massive Belt and Road project. No one is pulling up uh, Israel and its massive technology theft out of the US and elsewhere. A sick, psychotic, racial, and religiously supremacist state with an ultra right-wing extremist at the helm has the planet at his fingertips. Yes, it do. <laughs> anyway, it goes on to explain Israel's secret weapon here, how Israel totally dominates cybersecurity and has uh, planted high-level corporate spies all over the world. Uh, Israel drones worldwide. Russia and China and Israel working together. How Israel steals the U.S. technology. All, all these things. And there's links to... Uh, uh, sources for all this information. He's not just making it up just because he doesn't like Israel. This information is out there. It's all viewable and visible. Oh, you don't believe these websites that are giving you the information? Maybe because if you don't believe that, you believe your United States government, which I can't imagine why you would because they lie about everything. But here it is, uscode.house.gov slash view in the, in, the whole, in the whole link there. When you see Bibi bragging about how clever Israeli scientists are, uh, what he's really saying is his Russian immigrant scientists are very good at stealing U.S. tech. <laughs> so there you go. My first ever Maycow article. <laughs> Maybe my last ever Maycow article. We'll see well, we won't know that until the future, but uh, yeah, Henry, you're 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 a little 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 loony there, Henry. <laughs> but that's all right. The article is good information, like I said. 
Uh, so it's just something for you to keep in mind and, and track down. Now, out at MIT, the school out there in Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts, they have a thing out there where uh, they track the students. They track everywhere they go, everywhere they are, via uh, facial technology and their cards, the little cards they have, and, and other things. However, MIT students tend to be very bright, very in <laughs> inventive, uh, and, and they don't really like being tracked everywhere they go. So what have they done? MI stu MIT students create and circulate open source covert RFID rings to subvert the campus tracking system. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, 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 it's probably going on at other schools too, I don't know, but th these, these are specifically for MIT. Uh, and MIT has the brain power to uh, overcome that stuff. So there it is. A reader writes, a couple years ago, MIT changed their dorm security student tracking policy. They hired security contractors to work in dorms and required everyone to tap their RFID cards upon entry. No vouching for friends or guests. Most students complied. Some moved out. Some got in trouble. Fast forward to this week. There was a student-run ring delivery event on campus where roughly 100 students received a programmable RFID-capable device. Uh, most of these were rings that could be mistaken for class rings. Students also received documentation on the 125 kilohertz RFID system and how to make inexpensive reader-writer devices on how to produce more rings. Uh, this person has attached a copy of the documentation for your uh, viewing pleasure. Additional digital resources for the project can be found uh, at a, a GitHub site. And I think it is likely that new students will run this event again. I think it's pretty likely myself. <laughs> so, three cheers to those creative MIT students. <laughs> Yes, indeed, and, and if you could get that spread around through other places uh, where people like tracking you for whatever reason, I think that would be a great thing. All right, uh, we've talked about this in the chat a lot, a lot over the past several weeks, months, whatever, um, and, and, I, and I hate to report this one on this as well because uh, of the fact it does come from the New York Slimes, uh, New York Times, um, but it's information that is good. So here it is. Opioid users call Kratom a godsend. The FDA says it's a menace. This was posted on April 17th over here on this site by Richard A. Opel Jr. and Serge Kowalski. Kowalski, I don't know how you say his name, some Polish name. Uh, anyway. <laughs> the steep rise in the number of people suffering opioid addiction has helped spawn the widespread use of another substance, Kratom, a green powdered herbal supplement that is widely available and virtually unregulated derived from the leaves of, of a tree native to Southeast Asia and sold in the good old U.S. of A. online and in bodegas and head shops, Kratom has long been used as a mood booster, energy supplement, and pain reliever. A massive pain reliever. It's also uh, increasingly being used by those who swear by it as a curb... How did I lose my space there? Oh, as a curb for opioid addiction. That's right. If you're addicted to opioids, Kratom can relieve you of that. Some veterans also say it helps control symptoms 
of PTSD. Several million Americans are now believed to use Kratom. One is Andrew Turner, whose PTSD herniated discs and movement problems affecting his face and neck were so severe after multiple deployments with the Navy that he took as many as 20 prescription medications, including opioids, daily. I was on the path to suicide, losing hope, Mr. Turner said. After he began drinking Kratom tea, the pain and dread diminished, he said. It was a night and day difference. But authorities warned that crate authorities, <laughs> liars that call themselves authorities, warn that Kratom can be dangerous. Reported lies, side effects include seizures, hallucinations, but wait, is hallucinations a side effect or a benefit? And symptoms of psychosis. As there and, and opioids don't cause those and more, and there have been calls from inside the Trump administration to curb its use. A new government review links Kratom to nearly 100 overdose deaths. I have seen no evidence of any such thing. There is no evidence to indicate that Kratom is safe or effective. Um, there's also none to indicate that it's not safe or effective. But there is evidence to, con to conclude that it is safe and effective because people use it and it works for them. The FDA has warned people to avoid using Kratom, saying this hurts our profits. I mean, um, appears to have properties that expose users to risks of addiction. But, but, but no, it gets people off the addictive substances. It has also raised concerns about false marketing and impurities in the supply. And I do suggest that you uh, are careful of that, of, of getting an impure supply, that you get it from a good source and not... Well, just make sure that you get it from a good source. <laughs> That's all I'm saying on that. Uh, last week, the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention... Uh, weighed in, reporting that Kratom had been found to be a cause of death by medical examiners or coroners in 91 out of 27,000 overdose deaths. What, what's, what's that percentage? Um, uh, by agency over 18-month period ending in December 2017. I bet they're lying. <laughs> what do you bet they're lying? I bet they're lying. Uh, the new report, and again, this is, like I said, it's the New York Times, so you got to expect a lot of government propaganda involved here um, in this article because they're stoo stooges, stoolies, what? Parrots, stoolies, not that, but uh, stooges for the government, uh, the, the New York Times. They're, they're part of the, the system. <laughs> so... It goes on talking about a bunch of stuff, but let me just say this. I know that Kratom works. And I know that at least for one member here of reallibertymedia.com who was in the severe pain for a long time after a uh, quite the intense operation and was using opioids as a, a daily thing, that he switched over to using Kratom. And he's doing much better now. Much, much better now. He's off the opioids. And the pain has subsided. So, uh, he's but one example of the millions that are using it. So, I'm just saying, when the government says something, they're lying! <laughs> That's what they do. They are lying to you. Oh, but don't, don't uh, think you'll be able to use it forever because they don't want you to. They are afraid of that substance because, well, yeah, it, it cuts into their, their, their profit margin. And when I say they, I, I, I lump them all as one group because they are all one group. That means government and big pharma and, and the media, they're all part of the same 
structure in this militaristic environment you exist within. Speaking of militaristic environments, <laughs> oh God, <laughs> DARPA aims to develop next generation of mind-controlled tech for U.S. soldiers. And let me say this about that before I go on. DARPA aims to develop next generation of mind-controlled tech for soldiers. We're hearing about it. That means it's not only developed, but it's in use and has been for quite some time, or you would not be hearing about it. This was published February 20th over here on RT.com. Uh, so here it is. The Pentagon has been recruiting teams to develop neural interfaces which will allow humans to control machines with their minds in a combination of telekinesis and artificial intelligence. The Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, has requested proposals for next-generation neurotechnology to help bolster its pre-existing neural interface research. Existing neural interfaces have been used to allow humans, humans, to control prosthetic limbs, reproduce thoughts as text, and even fly drones with their minds. By combining these types of technologies, DARPA is hoping was hoping, now that, that it's done, they're not need, need to hope anymore, to augment and improve their capabilities, making the systems more efficient and effective. And they also have an article linked here, Brain Hacking and Memory Black Market. Cybersecurity experts warn of imminent risks of neural implants. Oh, God. Anyway, one particular issue the uh, agency is hoping to overcome centers around the brain's constant loss and regeneration of neurons. Neural interface technology must hone in on specific sections of the brain to function. And due to this cycle of loss and regrowth, current systems require near constant recalibration, which they can do automatically. DARPA is hoping that AI might be able to anticipate these neuronal changes and recalibrate systems automatically allowing for continuous use. The other main issue is that DARPA is looking to solve uh, to solve is to reduce noise of sensory information said to the brain from nerves throughout the human pilot's body. Teams working on this project will be required to build an AI powered interface capable of stimulating nerves within the body to send artificial signals such as a burning or a sense of touch without physical contact with a stimulus to maximize information content along the body's major nerves. <laughs> but if you're if you have this uh, a way to do this, if you're a, a, a technological whiz kid and you hope to win the DARPA contract, worth up to $1 million. A million dollars? It should be worth $100 million. At least. But you have until March 5th, which... Um, when was this article posted? Oh, February 20th. Okay, never mind. <laughs> you had until March 5th to apply. And then you will have 18 months to produce a working prototype. Uh, all told, DARPA is planning to invest $2 billion over the next five years, of your money, by the way, uh, to advance so-called third-wave AI projects. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you just love it? <laughs> Chicka boom. Oh, man. Uh, anyway, that's it. Um, that's all my stories for today. I did nine of them. Nine. Count them. Uh, <laughs> so I'll be back next week. Episode 24 will be next week. And uh, I, I hope you all come back and join me once again. And I hope you all stay part of Real Liberty Media. And I hope you all check the schedule to see what's coming up tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Because we do have shows every day of the week. 
maybe just one show a day, some some days more. Like I said, check the schedule on RealLibertyMedia.com or RLMRadio.xyz. And y'all, have yourselves a great week, a great evening if you're in the U.S., if you're in other parts of the world, maybe a great day. I don't know. I don't know what time it is where you are. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, man. I'll talk to you later. Peace.